Good morning, everybody. We are going to be in John chapter 14, so I hope that you brought your Bible. John chapter 14 is where we are going to continue this morning in our series on prayer. Hope that you are spending that time every day. We would love for you to use those prayer prompts that we've got out in the lobby. We would encourage you to pick up one of those. It's not too late to start if you hadn't started. You can join right along with us. Also, encourage you to come back tonight. Brother Mark will be preaching tonight. We are going to treat Sunday nights more like a class. And so Mark will be doing that as well tonight as he talks about prayer. And so we would really strongly encourage you to be back with us if you can at all. We are praying for you, every one of you, during this intentional time of prayer for our church our ministry team is praying for you and in the mixture of all of that what i am praying for all of us individually as people is that god would help us see the value of prayer that he would help us see the importance of prayer i said in class on wednesday night and it's, it's been a good learning experience for me that when you talk about prayer this much when you cover it in your sermon series and you talk about it in bible class even in private conversations in an effort to not be so repetitive you've got to really try to see all of the different dimensions of prayer and the good news is the bible gives us all of that there's so much about prayer that the bible reveals to us now, how many of us view prayer as the thing we do before we do what we do, right? Prayer is where you start and it prepares you to do whatever it is you're going to do, right? Have you ever thought about prayer that way? Prayer gets you started. Prayer prepares us. To do what we are supposed to do. Now on some level, there's truth in that. Prayer doesn't necessarily replace the conversations that could happen at your workplace or in your family or the practical ministry that a church might do. But prayer in and of itself is ministry. Prayer in and of itself is ministry. When you hear that term, ministry, what do you think of? What is ministry? How would you define that word ministry? The Apostle Paul would define that word in a rough way as service. Ministry is service. And so all of us do ministry. All of us do service on one level or another, or at least we should. We all serve in one way or another. And one of the things that we could or that we might serve other people through is prayer. So I want to convince you of this this morning. Prayer isn't what you do before you do what you do. Prayer can be what you do. Prayer is ministry. Prayer is service. And I want to read from John chapter 14. Before Jesus leaves this world in fact right before he leaves this world right before he is crucified and is then resurrected three days later he has a conversation that i know you've heard before i know that you've read this text before about heaven it seems with his apostles and disciples and it's found there in john chapter 14 this is the night before he is going to die so the anxiety around Jesus is high, right? The followers, they don't exactly know everything that's going to happen, but they know something's up. They can 
feel it in the air. So Jesus tells them, don't feel trouble in John 14, verse 1. Don't be anxious. Don't be fearful. He then gives them this picture of heaven. And it's a beautiful picture, isn't it? In God's house are many rooms. If it weren't so, I wouldn't have told you. There's many rooms in God's house. It's a big place. There's tons and tons of rooms. And I have prepared these rooms for you. You ever had a guest at your house and you prepared their room? What does that look like? That means you make the bed and you vacuum, right? You burn a candle to cover up whatever you're trying to hide. You know, that's what it means to prepare a room. And so Jesus says that's what he's done for us. He has prepared the rooms in heaven. And even though Jesus says, I'm going away, I will come back and I will take you to the house and show you the rooms. Thomas says in verse 5 of John 14, Lord, we know not where you are going. How can we know the way? Legitimate question, right? Sometimes we're hard on Thomas, but it's a legitimate question. Even though Jesus already gave him an answer before, right? He's going to come back and get him. But he answers with different words. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. In other words, if you know Jesus, you know God. Now, we went to a play, Casey and I did yesterday in Nashville on C.S. Lewis. And I just couldn't help but think about that as I was reading these words. Because C.S. Lewis says this is what separates Jesus from everybody else. He's the only one who claims to be the way, the truth, the life. Separates him from every other religious teacher. Jesus cannot just be a good moral guy. He can't just give good advice. And a lot of people in the world say, yeah, Jesus gives good advice. Jesus is more than that because he claims this. I'm the way, the truth. And the life. Philip, who also isn't listening, says, show us. Jesus lovingly says, how can you say that? I'm right here. I'm right here. And all I've done is show you the Father. Believe this. I am in the Father and the Father is in me. Now, this is such a great exchange between Jesus and his followers. And we hear this story from time to time at funerals, right? About the many rooms in heaven. And we think about this story within the context of the afterlife and the reward for the followers of Jesus. And and there's some of that going on for sure. But just like the original followers of Jesus and the original people in the text that weren't really listening to what Jesus was saying, I think it's easy for us to miss maybe Jesus' primary point. We immediately jump to the end and we think about how hard it is to understand the afterlife rather than seeing what Jesus is really saying. When Jesus talks about infinite rooms, and that's what Jesus really says, There are an infinite number of rooms in my father's house. We immediately think about our room. And that's that's okay on a level. But what I want you to see is Jesus is looking at the 12. And Jesus isn't saying, hey, 12. There's 12 rooms. And each of you have a room. Jesus is looking at the 12. And he says... There's an infinite number of rooms. So Jesus, what's the implication to that? He wouldn't come to Netherlands this morning and say, you know, if we got however many people are here this morning, that's the number of rooms there are in heaven. How great is that? And it is great that you have a room with your name on it. But what's the implication? Hey, 12, there's an infinite number of rooms. We hear Jesus' words and we think, wow, I have a room. And listen, you do. You have a room. But what Jesus is really saying on a much deeper level is that you got a room, but there's a lot of other rooms. How are we going to fill them? How are we going to get people in those rooms? That's why he says this 
in John 14, verse 12. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do. And greater works than these will he do. Because I am going to the Father. What works did Jesus do? You think about the ministry of Jesus. What works did he do? He healed. He fed. He taught. He served. And Jesus says, because I'm going to the Father's house to prepare the rooms, and there are an infinite number of rooms, I'm going to come back and I'm going to get you and I'm going to take you into your room. Hopefully you've got other people to put in their rooms and you're going to do the same works that I did. Now, what would change about your personal ministry or my personal ministry or the church's ministry if we thought about our ministry in terms of we are doing what Jesus did? So we serve because Jesus served. We teach because Jesus taught. We feed because Jesus fed. We heal because Jesus healed. Take heart. Jesus says, you're going to do the work that I have done after I leave. What a responsibility, right? What a responsibility. If you know there are rooms, infinite number of rooms, how many rooms can you fill by serving like Jesus? Who can you make sure gets into the adjoining room in Father's house? Because you serve like Jesus. Now catch this. The end of verse 12 through 14 of John 14. And greater works. You're going to do what Jesus did. You're going to do the works of me, Jesus says. And greater works. Greater? Greater? Greater works. Then these will he do because I am going to the Father. Really? We can do the greater works? We can do greater works than serving and teaching and feeding and healing? There's greater works than that? Whatever you ask in my name, this I will do. That the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. Did you catch it? Our Lord Jesus, the Lord, the one who said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, says what you do in terms of your work is a heritage to him. Do the works, have compassion. Serve, teach, do. Those are the works of Jesus. But Jesus says there's a greater work. And what is that? Asking. Prayer. Prayer on the lips of Jesus himself is the greater work. <laughs> That's unbelievable, right? Prayer is the greater work work our view sometimes my view sometimes is that prayer is like a cop out that lets me get off the hook from doing what I actually should be doing our view is that prayer is what you do before you do what you do but Jesus says prayer done with faith done the right way is the greater work. Is the work. Even greater than the compassionate work of Jesus himself. It's amazing to me. This prayer. This kind of prayer is ministry. This kind of prayer is service. This kind of prayer is work. In fact, the greater work. Now, would we believe. Would you believe that prayer. Prayer. This kind of prayer that Jesus is talking about could grow a church. Would you believe that? 
Do you think that prayer, this kind of prayer, can change your heart? Do you think this kind of prayer can equip a congregation? That prayer can comfort and heal. That prayer can guide. That prayer can change. Do you believe it? That's what Jesus says. Jesus says it's greater. Works. Now, here's the thing. Works and prayer aren't mutually exclusive, right? I mean, Jesus doesn't say it's the only work. He just says it's the greater work. So there's still stuff to do. It's not either or. But Jesus says prayer is greater. It takes the service and the evangelism and the deeds and the teaching. But prayer is greater. And for us, prayer can be what we do. Prayer is ministry. Oswald Chambers says it this way. Prayer does not equip us for greater works. Prayer is the greater work. What he says falls in line with what Jesus says himself. Prayer isn't getting you ready for the work. Prayer is the work. Prayer works in our hearts and it outflows through us and it changes the hearts of others. And this is hard. And I'll tell you why it's hard. It's hard to view prayer this way. Because prayer done like this is more work than work. Prayer done like this is more work than work. Romans 15, I appeal to you, brothers, by our Lord Jesus Christ and by the love of the Spirit to strive together with me in your prayers to God on my behalf. Colossians chapter 4 and verse 12, Epaphras, who is one of you, a servant of Christ Jesus, greets you always, struggling on your behalf in his prayers that you may stand mature and fully assured in all the will of God. That word struggle, that word wrestle that we see Paul using is the same word that we get the English word agonize from. These folks are agonizing in their prayers Here's our problem. We would rather organize than agonize. Because we are convinced that if we have better organizational skills and time management strategies, that somehow that's going to change. If the problem is methodology or philosophy, or if we can go to one more meeting, then we can fix it. If we have the right committees, then we can fix it. Here's my struggle. It's easier for me to go to a conference or to read a book or to go to a meeting or to go to lunch with somebody and think about church growth rather than think about praying. It's easier to organize than to agonize. And Jesus would tell us we're trying to do supernatural work through a natural means. And we're left empty handed. Haddon Robinson says the work is prayer and ministry is the reward for the work. In Acts 6, the leaders of the first church, the New Testament church, ran into some logistical issues dealing with women and orphans. So they find some deacons to do that job practically. And they say, we're going to stick with prayer. And the ministry of the word. You mean to tell me that the leaders of the first century church's plan for leadership was to pray? Yeah. That was it. In the Old Testament, when the Amalekites come to battle with the Hebrews, Moses says, Joshua, I want you to go fight the battle. I'm going to go up on the hill with my stick and I'm going to pray. Moses, the greatest leader before the exile in the Old Testament's view on leadership is, first, I'm going to pray. That's the plan? That's the plan. Who's the greatest leader after the exile? Nehemiah sees the walls torn down around Jerusalem and it breaks his heart. The people are in ruins. What does the Bible say Nehemiah does? He doesn't appoint a task force. He prays for four months. Four months. He prays. And then one day, the richest man in the world shows up and says, how much is it going to cost? Here's a check. In Acts 4, we mentioned this as we started this series, the believers are released from prison 
and facing extreme persecution in their lives or on the line, what'd they do? They pick it. They carry a sign down the road. The Bible says they got together and they prayed as a group. Asking for boldness. More boldness. And the Bible says that God shook the floor. You see, brothers and sisters, when it comes to faith, prayer is the work. It's not what you do before. It's what you do. We don't believe that marriages have to end. We don't believe that people have to hurt. We don't believe that people have to stay in addiction. We don't believe that people have to live in anger. We don't believe that the world has to stay the same. More and more and more I'm realizing that what was meant to be normal in the kingdom of God is what we call extraordinary today. And the difference, the only difference, is prayer is the work. How can we intercede for other people? As Paul lays out to Timothy what ministry looks like through prayer, he says, I want you to intercede for other people. How can we do that? How can we usher other people to the throne of God, whether they know we're doing it or not? How can we serve people? How can we minister to them? How can I, listen, struggle with God in prayer for somebody else? That is where prayer becomes work. It's hard enough to struggle with God in prayer at all, but especially for somebody that's not me. But where prayer becomes ministry and prayer becomes work is when I seek to intercede for other people. When I know somebody is hurting and I struggle with God on their behalf, that's when prayer becomes work. That's ministry. And that is using supernatural means to treat supernatural problems. There was this little boy that went to a grocery store Went shopping with his mama. They were in the checkout line and the person behind the counter that was scanning all the barcodes and taking the money asked the mom if he could give that little boy some candy. The mother said, sure, that'd be fine. The grocer got a jar of candy and he held it out to the little boy. He took the top off. It was full of candy. He said, son, get some candy. Well, the little boy said, no. He said, Candy, right? Get some candy. The little boy said, no, no, thank you. Well, the man started to get a little concerned as to why a little boy wouldn't want free candy. So he stretched the jar out a little further. The little boy looked and the clerk, he still told him no. The clerk said, you can take as much candy as you want. Take as much candy as you can fill your hands with. It's free. Take it. With a confused look, our clerk, he made one last effort. And held the jar out. And the little boy said, would you get the candy for me? Well, the clerk happily agreed to get the candy. He reached in the jar and he got the candy. And he gave all the candy in his hand to the boy. And the boy said, thanks. When his mama and he were in the car on the way home, she curiously asked, why didn't you get the candy yourself? Why were you being so rude? Why did you make the clerk get the candy for you? Her son innocently replied, because, Mama, his hands are bigger than mine. I get more candy that way. Right? Smart boy. Right? He understood that the hands at the source were bigger than his own hands. That's what prayer is. Supernatural work to treat supernatural problems. We go to the source on behalf of other people, asking as ministry. Because church, God's hands are bigger than ours. My hands pale in comparison to God's hands. Who do you know that needs you to struggle? Who do you know that needs you to intercede? 
the reason that I think prayer is ministry is that you can do that anywhere, anytime, for any amount of time. There's limitations on how you serve and how you teach and how you feed and clothe. Important, vital, irreplaceable, all of those things. But prayer is ministry and prayer is the work because it can happen anywhere. Never limited. Prayer is the work. Prayer is ministry because it's limitless and it connects us to a God who is limitless. Who can you intercede for? Who needs you to pray for them? Let's bow and pray together. Father God, we are grateful for this time. We're thankful for every opportunity that you give us. Bless us, we pray, as we seek to intercede for other people and view prayer as ministry, view prayer as doing what we do. We need your help, and we pray in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. This morning, we offer you the opportunity to respond in some way. Maybe you need some prayer. We are happy to intercede for you on your behalf to give you hope and encouragement and love. We freely offer that. If there's something that's wrong, something that you need, maybe you're not a believer, boy, today's a good day. Today is a good day to start your walk with Jesus. We freely offer you our encouragement and our love. This is a place of peace, not a place of judgment. And we will love you, we promise. If we can help you, let us know what we can do while together we stand and sing.